This is uh, the seventh session of the virtual educational uh, channel organized by the ESO and the S Empire. And today, the case will be presented um, by Professor Denis Collet. Thank you for being here from uh, Bordeaux in France. Today, we have um, about 60 participants uh, registered in 25 countries. And I will let uh, Robert make the introduction. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, just to say that uh, this is a seventh of, uh, in a series of clinical case discussion that is inaugurated last year in May 2020 uh, in order to underscore its mission of education in the field of multidisciplinary gastroenterology. Each time, it is a pilot center of the vast ESO Stanford Senpai platform, you have the map here, which took in charge the organization of what since then has been called a virtual staff meeting, an event that each time goes beyond the borders, of course, of uh, the organizing center. Previous discussions, you may remember, have taken place from Milan, from Kenya in Bomet, from Stanford University, uh, from the Palo Alto, in Palo Alto, from Beijing, from Geneva, from Melbourne, and today from France in Bordeaux. And this discussion represents a kind of uh, return, I should say, to the basic activity of the pilot centers of the platform since it was from Bordeaux and the Olivec Hospital that the first course of the training program of the Raison Sampard platform was set up and proposed to the scientific community by an ESO center. This first experience was in 2019, tu t'en souviens Denis, en 2019, during two full days that allowed us to welcome surgeons from Russia for one-to-one -one exchanges that left everyone with the best impressions. Now, new suivant slide, Frédéric, s'il te plaît. And it was Professor Denis Collet, who at this time was fully responsible for the success of this first course of the platform, the details of which you can find on our website. Denis is the one who today is presenting a case that he chose for its particular educational interest with his assistant, Professor Caroline Grenier. Here you can see her. Denis constituted a very fine multidisciplinary panel. Indeed, you can see that this panel will comprise Stéphane Munning, Theatre of Surgeon of the Geneva Pilot Center. And uh, Stefan was the organizer of the 14th uh, Oiso Congress that was held in Geneva in 2017. With him, the panel will comprise Stefan Bonnet, a surgeon with Brice Gaillet uh, of uh, the Paris Pilot Center and he will be in charge of, uh, they will be in charge also of a clinical case discussion in April, in the month of April. And the third one in this panel will be Maria Westerhoff. And uh, Maria is a faithful friend of Ozo. She is a faithful as has been since the very beginning of Ozo. I, I don't dare to, tell you in what year it was. So <laughs> she has been faithful, as has been her mentor in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Henry Appleman, who served as ESO president in the mid twenties. Maria has been involved with ESO for over 10 years and she belongs to what we call the esophageal family. She brings to every session she attends her smile, her enthusiasm, and distinct scientific skills that she lends to the discussion. You will see that in just a few moments. The case that Caroline 
and Denis are going to present to you is of considerable interest through the review that they will offer to all of you of the whole panorama of treatments for a cancer of the esophagogastric junction. And perhaps at the end of the discussion, we'll also learn more of the differences between signet cells and goblet cells. Denis, je te passe la parole pour une formidable discussion que nous sommes impatients d'entendre. Il n'y a pas de son. Ah ben c'est parfait. Frédéric, tu m'entends Ok, ok. Ok, is it ok Est-ce qu'on a entendu ou bien s'il n'y avait pas de son Non, non. Oui, c'est bien. bien. Mieux, mais... Tout à l'heure, ça marchait très bien. Mais est-ce qu'on a entendu ce que j'ai dit là ou pas Oui. Ah bon, ben ça passe. Alors, je t'entends très bien là. Ok. I'll try to share my screen. And before, I would like to apologize for my awful English on my awful French accent. I will try to be understandable. We can see your screen, great. Yes. First, I would like to... The case we are going to discuss today about the, the very specific problem of signet ring cell cancer of the EG junction, which is not very rare and which has a very lo a lot of problems. Before, I would like to do some... to, to say some words about our center. We use in Bordeaux, we live in Bordeaux. Bordeaux is a university hospital in the southwest of the France. And it is for George. Bordeaux is very famous for our wines, which are certainly one of the best of all the world. We have the chance to work in this university hospital. When you see it is very comfortable. And we have a hospital which is specifically dedicated to digestive disease, including a big unit of surgery, gastroenterology, and all the facilities for intensive care units, radiology, endoscopy, radiotherapy, and oncology. The department, the surgical department, is divided in three units. Each unit is dedicated to as a pancreatobilial surgery by Professor Chich and Christophe Laurent, colorectal surgery by Professor Rullier, which is very, who is very famous, and his colleague, Professor Donos, and usogastric and endocrine surgery by myself and Professor Gonia, my colleague. We have seven operating theaters and 30 beds for intensive, in, intensive care units, and we are well equipped for heavy surgery. About the esogastric surgery, in our unit, we are three senior surgeons, Caroline, Dr. Nadja, and myself, two assistants, Dr. Laurent and Picard, and three residents. And during the last year, despite the COVID, uh, the, the epidemic, we did 84 the phagectomies, 14 myotomies for achalasia, 40 surgeries for very large yatal hernia, and so, so 37 anti-reflux surgeries. And we do also gastrectomies for cancer and bariatric surgery as well. Thank you, Professor Collet. So it's my pleasure to present to you the case of a 61 year old male who lives in Tahiti Island. He has a normal BMI. He only has an history of gastroesophageal reflux disease treated in 2014 by proton pump inhibitors during four months for heartburns. He had neither endoscopy nor follow-up. But in December 2019, he went in outpatient clinic for new episodes of heartburn. He had a mild dysphagia 
initial weight loss of six kilograms and the normal rate of hemoglobin. He also has a history of asthma and ulcerative colitis without current treatment. An upper GI endoscopy was performed and demonstrated an esophageal tumor without stenosis in the distal esophagus, extended downwards to the lesser curvature of stomach. The extension was evaluated from 35 to 42 centimeters from the dental arch, and the deadline was located at 40 centimeters. Pathological examination was in favor of a moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma with signet wing cells. It's interesting to focus on the specificities of signet wing cells gastric cancer. First, let's focus on the classification. Since 1965, uh, um, different classification has been proposed to define poorly cohesive ad cells adenocarcinoma. To begin with, Lorentz classification, who described the diffuse type, then Nakamura uh, classification in 1968, the undifferentiated undifferentiated um, cells. Then Ming in 1977 described an infiltrative tip. Then Goseki uh, de described the poorly differentiated type with or without mucinous features. Carnera defined independent cells and Caravalli a diffuse type. Previous WHO classification in uh, 2010 described the poorly cohesive uh, carcinoma, which is uh, neoplastic cells with arrangement of our aggregates, including single queen cells adenocarcinoma, predominantly or exclusively single queen cells or other variants. Finally, the European chapter of ECGA consensus in 2017 describe the PCC and the signal ring cell adenocarcinoma. That is not a, an official uh, classification, but it puts together signal ring cells type with an amount of signal ring cell higher than The microphone is not and can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 it's okay now. And, and mm. so I said that uh, the third type in the poorly cohesive um, uh, nose with less than 10% uh, of signet wing cells. Any amount in the biopsy or in the surgical um, specimen with some type reassessment. Uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Westerhoff uh, would like to comment on this classification. I don't know if she's here. I'm here. Um, I was going to try to show you a picture. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. But I cannot seem to share my screen. So, <laughs> um, could you let me share my screen? Yeah. Just Can you try again? Okay, sure. Um, well, I was going to show you mostly. Um, can you see my screen now? Or, oh, yeah. Here we just are. To, well, um, I just want to show you a picture of the signet ring cells just for your. Um, just so you know what we're looking at. We're talking about signet rings here. And um, I mean, this, this slide is about margins, but just so that you can see signet rings really do like look like signet ring cells. Um, they have this single cell with the nucleus pushed like their signet part and this mucin. But sometimes, like you said, they're just called poorly cohesive because as you can see here, cells like this, cancer cells here, they don't necessarily 
have to have that signet ring morphology. So these are called poorly cohesive. So I can just, that was just my interjection. You can go ahead. Great. Thank you. Can't you sit more? Thanks a lot for sharing that. Yes, and uh, we are, you see that uh, in the previous classification, the percentage of uh, signet ring cells might play a role in an important role for the prognosis, probably the preoperative workup, and for sure for the treatment. In our practice, the pathologists do not give us this rate. And uh, either on the biopsy or even on the specimen. And we would be very interested to know about uh, what about in the audience? What is your practice? Do your pathology give you uh, this, uh, this rate? And has it any importance in your current practice? Who, who can respond uh, even in the, among the experts, uh, Stefan or Stefan? Yeah, the, the signal ring cell carcinoma is really a problem uh, because of uh, the probably not so good response for chemotherapy because of the extension of the tumor. And uh, I think it's important to know uh, 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 the, the histology in detail before treatment. Um, and uh, in my uh, practice, um, if I have a, a signal ring cell carcinoma, uh, I would really look for the response, the clinical response of the, uh, of the chemotherapy. And if there is really absolutely no response, probably it is better uh, to go to surgery uh, after two cycles, as an example of FLOT. If, uh, so this is one of the things. The evidence is not so high but it's the clinical practice uh, I would do. That means that you perform an early evaluation just yes, after yes, two absolutely. absolutely, but, but you know, many of these patients uh, are coming with dysphagia. And uh, 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 if you start with FLOT as an example, and after two cycles, uh, the dysphagia is not much better uh, then it's a sign that the response, uh, re, re, uh, the, the response is not good. And then I would really look uh, for uh, after two cycles uh, uh, for imaging uh, and probably to go to surgery. Um, uh, this is for me the only thing I would, uh, would look uh, in, in signal ring cell carcinoma. And uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, in, um, in, uh, in our team, we are very frightened by uh, signet uh, ring cells. And uh, as far as we have uh, signet uh, ring cells on biopsy, we don't have by the pathologist, we don't have the, the percentage. But uh, it's our policy to be very cautious with uh, the symptoms of the patient. Uh, it means if there is uh, dysphagia, um, dysphagia after the, the second uh, the second sequence of chemotherapy. Uh, sometimes we do uh, earlier revelation with CT scan, but sometimes we do only three uh, chemotherapy and we do uh, surgery uh, as far as possible because we are very frightened by um, the, the possibility of positive margin. So, and uh, we are very, uh, very prudent with uh, the chemotherapy. We don't, uh, we don't go uh, at the end of the chemotherapy if the dysphagia is not, uh, is not better. It's our policy in, in, uh, in the center area. So you do not do PET scan for these patients? No, not systematically. So the, the, the problem with the PET scan is that, especially the diffuse cancer, uh, are in many times uh, not positive for PET scan. And uh, uh, so uh, PET scan is beautiful to, to look for metastasis uh, uh, in, uh, in the squamous cell carcinoma, but in, in, in adenocarcinoma, uh, uh, it is 
it is very difficult. You, you, you see sometimes positive lymph nodes and then you do the surgery and uh, if you compare it with the pathology, they were not positive. And you see, uh, 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 and you find uh, positive lymph nodes and the PET was not positive. So the PET is, it's, it's very difficult. And in Germany, it's in the new S3 guideline, uh, which is just now for, for the publication, it is not uh, a, a real recommendation for PET scan in adenocarcinoma. But it's, it's not really clear. But if it were positive, if it showed distant metastasis, would you consider doing any further surgical evaluation or you would just continue with chemotherapy? In case of distant, distant metastasis, the, there is no place for surgery and uh, we, we go for chemotherapy and we know that unfortunately it is not very, very efficient. And but, when I, it is but, but I would really prove it. I have done last year two cases. One was a positive uh, 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 hepatic metastasis in the PET scan. It was positive. And then we have done a biopsy, nothing. And then we have done a, a, a surgery and we have done a resection of this area. It was not metastasis. And the other one was with the surrenal, uh, with the, um, um, what is the, in here, surrenal uh, metastasis in the PET scan, and it was a ferrocomocytom. Uh, and uh, so the PET scan is really dangerous. Uh, uh, both cases uh, would, would not go for surgery if you would say, okay, this is distant metastasis. And what about if there is only one metastasis in the liver, for example? If the patient is uh, oligometastatic, uh, the, the attitude is, uh, is definitely chemotherapy, or sometimes uh, you can do uh, first laparoscopy, resection, then after chemotherapy, and if the patient uh, has no more uh, metastasis, uh, can you uh, imagine to do the, the surgery? I think this can be considered in the non signal cell a signal yeah. ring cell tumor, but uh, in the very particular case of signal ring cells, I think uh, there, is, there is no place for surgery in the, when, whenever there is a distant metastasis. I, I agree. The, the prognosis is so poor that what we we can imagine uh, to do the, the the excision of metastasis. I think in oligometastatic case, I would really uh, uh, go for uh, 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 effective chemotherapy, FLOT as an example, and then I would do a reevaluation. And if there is a real good response, and the patient is young, and the patient is in a good state, uh, for uh, probably there is a place, you know that we are uh, with the IO now doing this trial, the Renaissance trial, and we are looking especially for this, we randomize the, 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 the multimodal treatment with surgery uh, and uh, with uh, chemotherapy alone, but it's an open question. If you agree, we are going on about uh, our patients and we will continue further discussion along this talk. Uh, there are some specificities for the preoperative pre -operative workup in case of uh, uh, diffuse type, and it is due to the poor sensibility to the uh, CT scan to the CT scan to detect a very uh, mild peritoneal carcinomas carcinosis, which is very frequent with very little tumor deposit in the peritoneum, and we think that the preoperative celloscopy, laparoscopy. Uh, is mandatory for to take a decision. And the second characteristic is that the tumor has a very low uptake of uh, fluoroglucose and the PET scan tends to be, tend to under-evaluate, to underestimate the staging of the tumor. And frequently, the tumor is more extended that that was foreseen by the preoperative CT scan. Uh, a PET scan. 
This is a CT scan of our patient. And you see that there is a thickening of the esophageal wall in the thorax, in the lower part, lower, dist, uh, lower third of the esophagus. A very big tumor extended to the high, higher part of, where he, it's in the hiatus, extended to the uh, higher part of the uh, less cover, uh, lesser, cover, less, lesser curvature, sorry. And the PET scan confirmed the presence of a big tumor. And this can be summarized on this graph with a very large tumor extended from the distal part of the esophagus to the proximal part of the stomach with at least two nodes uh, close to the tumor. The laparoscopy did not show any parietal metastasis. And the question now is how to treat this patient and what would you propose? Yes. Good question. <laughs> we let the audience give us the proposal of management. The upper, the upper pole of the tumor was at 35 centimeters. Yes, it is. Yeah. What, what kind uh, at the level of the uh, pulmonary vein? Or uh, above? Uh, below, below. Below, below. Below. So, so this kind of tumor needs to, to, to perform a total gastrectomy. We, we agree with that. And uh, uh, is it necessary to remove the entire of the fagus? It is the, the, the question, I mean. That's the question. Yeah. We are going to, to focus on the, um, the uh, surgical technique a little bit later. Uh, okay. I propose you to begin with a focus on the global prognosis of signet ring cells adenocarcinoma. In a recent study, retrospective study, including 180 patients resected for gastric adenocarcinoma, 59 had poorly cohesive cells with, with versus 100 patients had non poorly cohesive cells. The two groups were matched according to age, gender, ASA score, and PTNM stage. The signet ring cells group had a significantly shorter median survival, higher rate of lymph node invasion, a lower R0 resection rate, a shorter time to recurrence, and a higher rate of recurrence with peritoneal. Um, carcinomatosis. But it's also known that at an early stage, I mean when the muscularis uh, mucosae is not involved by the tumor, the prognosis, prognosis of signet ring cells adenocarcinoma seems to be better or similar than non-signet ring cells carcinoma. It has also been described that the risk of peritoneal recurrence was linked with an advanced T and N stage and with linitis plastica. Uh, large multicentric uh, retrospective study uh, presented in the last International Gastric Cancer Congress focused on the survival according to the percentage of poorly cohesive cells. Indeed, in this study, 308 consecutive patients who had surgical resection for gastric adenocarcinoma between 1999 and 2016 was included. All hematoxylin and eosin stained slides were retrieved, and a second review of all slides was performed without knowledge of initial review and clinical data. Histological reassessment was performed to classify classify uh, gastric adenocarcinoma into three groups, major component of poorly cohesive self, more than 50%, minor component of poorly cohesive self, uh, less than 50%, and non-PCC. And it demonstrated 
that the survival was worse in PCC patients, but without differences between major and minor components. So the question which arose, uh, arises now is which uh, preoperative management would you propose? Would you prefer, propose preferentially uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy or neoadjuvant radiochemotherapy? The question is very difficult because of um, uh, normally for, uh, uh, for so in my opinion this is a ZVAT2 can cancer with a with a long infiltration of the esophagus and an infiltration of the stomach. It is a single ring cell carcinoma, and um, um, the we know that if you give flot, uh, there is a possibility of response. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, not like. Uh, in the in the trial uh, uh, described by Christophe Mariette, that uh, uh, the response is absolutely very bad, but it's not so good as in the intestinal type. So this is a problem. On the other hand, neoadjuvant radiochemotherapy. Um, uh, if you have a big tumor, the local control is better. Uh, it's it's really difficult to say to do this or to do that. We have not the real evidence, but probably because of it's a single drink cell carcinoma and this large part of the stomach, I would go for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Is there any other comments in the audience? I agree with the uh, uh, chemotherapy. Uh, I mean, I think that the radio chemotherapy, the radi preoperative radio chemotherapy, um, it has been shown by um, Irish studies uh, that it is not uh, as efficient. So uh, uh, when there are single um, signature ring cells, uh, there is no good chemotherapy, but I would prefer uh, preoperative chemotherapy rather than radio chemotherapy. It's our policy. Yes, let's continue regarding the preoperative chemotherapy. In the paper published by Albatron about uh, the flot in the Lancet in 2016, when you look at the group of the patient who had a complete response to preoperative chemo, you see that a very, very low, percent, low rate of patient with diffuse type, signaturing cells. And even in the group of patients who had either a total or partial response to the preoperative uh, chemo, there was a low rate of patients with diffuse type. And in the particular case of diffuse type tumor, it doesn't seem that there is any advantage of one chemo, one type of chemo to the other. And float was also efficient or also inefficient than the classical ECF. This is the global survival of the patient who had a gastric carcinoma as a diffuse or with or intestinal with uh, chemotherapy. This is a patient with non-diffuse tumor with non-signant ring cell tumor on the patient, the group of patients who had the chemotherapy and signet, signet ring cells, and the difference is obvious. In the group of patients who had a tissue style signet ring cell tumor, we can see that the chemotherapy doesn't seem to bring any advantage. The preoperative chemo doesn't seem to me to bring any advantage in terms of overall survival, and even it might be that the preoperative chemotherapy could be associated with a lower survival rate, probably due to the delay of surgery due to the chemotherapy. And maybe in some cases, the preoperative chemotherapy is considered as a loss of chance for the patient. 
it is not so easy and it is sometimes more uh, just complicated. These are two group of patients, one with signatory cells and the other with uh, other pathology of the classical adenocarcinoma. And you see that even in patients with signatory cell cancer, in some cases, there was a, a good response to the preoperative chemo. And the preoperative chemo, the efficiency of the preoperative chemo is always associated with a better survival as it is classically observed in the non-signatory cell cancer. The problem is that up to now, we, have, we cannot detect the patient who will be sensitive to the preoperative chemo and when it is inefficient, it is probably a lot of chance. And maybe in the future, we will be able to find from factor, some of the factor which, uh, of sensitivity to the treatment. Regarding the radiotherapy, we will be short. We have at least three studies. We demonstrated clearly that the, there is no place for the radiotherapy in this particular case of uh, uh, signal twin cells. In summary, there is poor response to the chemotherapy, whatever the type of chemo, and the float doesn't bring, seem to bring any advantage. There is some rare response and no impact of radiotherapy. Thank you. So, which is really difficult that uh, there is no study who focused specifically for uh, on uh, GIL junction uh, as signatric cell. We, we mm -hmm. try to, to extrapolate from uh, other studies focusing on esophageal uh, cancer or on uh, gastric cancer, but we have to do with, with uh, only a subgroup analysis. So, our decided was to perform the perioperative chemotherapy. Uh, we do not have the habit to make an early uh, evaluation. So we performed a four cycle flot over two months. It ended on of, uh, the 6th of May. The patient experienced no uh, toxicity with a weight gain of one kilo and the CT scan was stable. So now it's time to think about surgery, which resection are possible. First possibility is to perform the old uh, operation of sweets, which is uh, really, really uh, rarely uh, performed in France. It's a nasogastric resection according to sweet with a, a thoracophrenal laparotomy. The second possibility is to perform an Ivor Lewis resection with the risk of air one resection of the stomach. We have the habit to perform it through laparoscopy and thoracoscopy with a mini invasive, uh, um, with a mini uh, thoracotomy to perform the anastomosis. The third possibility is to perform a nasogastric, a, noso, a total oesogastrectomy with intrathoracic oesogenal anastomosis. It's an interesting um, operation, but the difficulty is to uh, be able to put the uh, jejunal loop very uh, high in the thorax. It's possible sometimes, like on this uh, picture, to put it just uh, below uh, the um, azegos. And the fourth possibility is a total gastrectomy with colonoplasty, with thoracoscopy, laparotomy, and cervicotomy. Because in our habit, we never uh, put um, azocolic uh, anastomosis in the chest because we, are, we fear the uh, uh, dramatic uh, uh, consequences of a, 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 a nasocolic fistula in the chest due to uh, the, uh, the mediastinitis. Or there perhaps also other um, proposition, what, are your, what is your opinion? What should we do for this patient? 
So the first, uh, the, the, the first thing, my experience with these enlarged tumors, six, seven, eight centimeters with infiltration of the esophagus and the stomach. At the end, the prognosis is uh, determined by the lymph node metastasis and by uh, the peritoneal carcinomatosis. In Cologne, with Arnold Felscher, we have done a series of, uh, uh, of oesogastrectomies with coloplasty. And uh, at the end, the majority of patients died uh, because of the, the extended lymph node um, infiltration. So uh, for me, it's important if it, if it is possible to get free margins, uh, I will do a, a gastrectomy uh, with a, a partial esophagectomy, but I think if the tumor is uh, up to 35 centimeters, it will be difficult. Um, if it would not be a, 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 a signal ring cell carcinoma, I would do an Ivan Lewis operation with a subtotal esophagectomy and the hemigastrectomy and the very small uh, uh, conduit. Uh, in, in this case, um, usogastrectomy is oncologically probably the best option, but it changed nothing in the prognosis, I think. Thank you for your very uh... Honest comments. <laughs> it's very, very interesting and uh, very, very big deal to, do, to decide. I think uh, the choose of uh, uh, total oesogastrectomy with coloplasty is uh, the secure procedure to, to be sure to have free margin. But there is almost uh, no rescue after that. If there is any problem, uh, it's hard to do another colo coloplasty after first coloplasty. It's possible, it is possible, but it's very, very difficult. And j just to, to, to be sure, when you do uh, the gastrectomy with uh, um, esophageal uh, anastomosis, and your picture, we see the, the azygos, so you use right thoracotomy. Yes, that's yeah? it. Yeah. Uh, and you uh, you keep uh, access to the to the abdomen to to do the the, the Rouen uh, uh, preparation. Yes, we do the, and, and the operation in a semilateral uh, position. Yeah, position. Yeah. Okay, we have intraoperatively an access at the thorax and the abdomen at the same time. And yeah. what do you think about the the, the left uh, thoracophrenal laparotomy? Mm. Uh, it means like uh, Belsi. Uh, procedure, you can have access to the, the left uh, thorax and you can catch the diaphragm and have access to the abdomen. Uh, sure, you're limited by the arch of the aorta. You can go, uh, you, you can go further on the esophagus. What do you think of this possibility to, to access to the left uh, thorax? I think it is a very comfortable for the surgeon. You have a wonderful view of the EG junction area. Uh, but uh, uh, it is you, you take the risk to have a positive margin of yeah. the esophagus, and you cannot go much uh, higher than the pulmonary vein. Therefore, that, that's, that's, the, that's the reason we, why we prefer right access. And actually, to be honest, this picture was very particular, and it is very rare to have the possibility to place the, uh, the, the abdominal, the, the loop, just under the hazygos arch. That's the reason why I took the picture, actually. <laughs> With Japanese nice. patients, it's probably possible, but <laughs> it must be I very think... thin. So before taking our we, uh, decision, we uh, looked at the recommendation. So we looked for a recommendation for a rejection margin for those specific uh, signal ring cell uh, carcinoma, but there is no specific recommendation. We can look at different classification on different proposals. The German group proposed a eight centimeters margin for diffuse type. The GERCG proposed a proximal margin 
of at least three centimeters for T2, T2 or uh, deeper tumors with an expansive growth pattern and five centimeters for those with infiltrative growth pattern and diffuse Lorentz uh, histotype. The French uh, proposal was for um, gastric cancer to perform a, a, a total gastric, uh, gastrectomy only uh, in the case of Linitis plactica or for um, proximal tumors with a proximal margin of five to six centimeters and a distal margin uh, of two to uh, three centimeters. And the G JCA uh, um, group proposed a proximal margin of at least three centimeters and five centimeters for infiltrative growth pattern. And the a small proposal was a a proximal match margin of five centimeters, but for diffuse type of eight centimeters is uh, advocated. So to sum up, we feel that um, for those uh, signature cells, which has a, a propension to diffuse in the submucosa, uh, everyone would like to have a very extensive margin. That's why we uh, decided uh, to, uh, to perform the uh, uh, a zoogastric total um, gastrectomy. Just, just um, uh, we look at the, at the literature, and when you type, I took I took a picture of the screen. When you go to PubMed and you type cardia and signature cells and extent of surgery or type of surgery or surgery, you find nothing. That means that all we have discussed before was about the gastric cancer, the gastric cancer with a signature cell, but the specific problem of cancer of the EG junction is not addressed in the literature. And the argument that which were considered to take the decision was of course for the diffuse type. And the problem is it is a very infilt infiltrating tumor with a risk of positive margin, either proximal or distal, in this case, or proximal. A young patient, we have to offer him the best chances for cure, and is able to undergo a very aggressive <coughs> treatment. You know that the R1 resection is always palliative, always palliative, and the surgery should absolutely be considered if it can achieve a R0 uh, resection, a margin-free resection. And on the other hand, if you do, if we, we do a total uh, esogastrectomy, we have to do a colonoplasty. And the problem, we know that the functional results of colonoplasty are not very good. It are, uh, uh, they are not very constant. It may vary from a patient to another with some good results and sometimes very poor results. And finally, this was uh, our, uh, our idea that the uh, under treat is palliative and it's very uh, big problem in the young patient, but over treat may be harmful. And we have to take a decision between <clears throat> these, two, these, two these two problems. To, to finish about surgery, and I, uh, maybe we will discuss uh, shortly. Surgery in the Siever 3, uh, Siever 3 to signal twin cell, the total gastrectomy is recommended. In Siever 1 tumor, and the oesophagectomy is recommended. And by arithmetic, this patient has Siever 1 to 3, and we had to add the procedure which are usually recommended. That's the reason why we decided to do a total oesogastrectomy. Just some few words and we have the chance to have in the panel, Dr. Waterhoff. As a surgeon, we dream to adjust the surgery, the resection to the, uh, the, to the margin, to the, the to the invasion of the margin. And maybe that the frozen section, we, we, we would like that it could help us to determine the level of the section. And I would be pleased to 
have the comment of our colleague, pathologist, about the, the, the performance, the, the sensitivity and sensibility of uh, uh, frozen section in the particular case of uh, tumor uh, of a ring cell tumor. Yes, thank you. Um, so I've rotated in several institutions um, in the United States, um, um, including University of Chicago, Yale, uh, University of Washington, which was my first job. And every institution seems to practice differently. So um, for example, at Yale, they froze everything. So they were freezing many, many margins. Whereas at University of Washington with um, Brent Oeschlager, he would only want a gross uh, assessment. And he understood that frozen sections were very difficult on signet ring cells. So, um, so here, like you said, there is literature on this. And if you consider that the overall discrepancy rate between frozen section and the final read uh, for all frozens is 4.6%, uh, signet ring cell cancer uh, causes an overall 8.4% reported discrepant rate. In one study, like you said, from um, Spicer in 2014, uh, the um, specifically on esophageal gastric adenocarcinoma margins, the sensitivity for frozens was 67%. Specificity was 100%, meaning there's a lot more false negatives. And the false negative reads were all mostly um, due to signet ring cell. So bottom line, um, when there's a signet ring cell cancer, the potential high rate of false negative uh, is there. So it causes for us uh, as pathologists to um, give you a false negative result is that, um, I don't know, it, it, this is maybe an American <laughs> term, um, phrase, but we say we're looking for a needle in a haystack. You're looking for, everything looks like needle and you have to find that real needle in this haystack. So it's unfrozen, it can be very challenging. So um, to you, you know, the esophagus looks this big, but to us under the microscope, it looks huge. So here's the lumen here, and then the squamous mucosa, the muscularis mucosa and submucosa and muscularis propria. So we're looking, this is just one section. We're looking through all of this to find this one tiny cancer. So that's that needle in the haystack. And this is a quick, re, uh, quick processing. So the frozen artifact is extremely distorting. So all of this freezing artifact from the water inside the tissue freezing distorts the tissue so much that um, it can be very challenging to read. So main in the uh, studies that um, there are some recent ones um, from 2021 and 2020, they talk about how uh, poorly cohesive cells in particular can uh, look very similar to the background cells because of that, uh, because of the lack of um, cohesion. So usually cancer um, causes cohes cohesiveness and we can see it, but these single infiltrating cells can look just like background inflammatory cells. So here in black is a, um, a cancer cell. And then here, this is not a cancer cell. So you can see it can be very challenging in a, a high pressure situation. And like you said, this signet ring cell that I showed you before, right, signet ring versus what they call poorly cohesive. These poorly cohesive cells don't have that mucin necessarily. So it, even though it can be sometimes easier to see these signet ring cells, these poorly cohesive cells can be very challenging because they don't have that mucin. And then the background stromal response, what you, what you guys uh, detect as thick induration or something firm, we know because it's the stroma causes this fibrous reaction, but that doesn't necessarily happen with um, signet ring cells or poorly cohesive tumors. And then finally, there's sampling errors. So if, um, we see the first cut on a section and it has no tumor, but then on deeper sections through the cancer on final read, there may be a focus of tumor there. So there's a sampling error in that. And um, that's 
kind of it with my our experience. Um, every institution seems to do it differently in the United States, um, whether just gross assessment or frozen assessment. And it's a high rate of um, tumor. Oh, you can't see our, you can't see my slides. No, no unfortunately. Oh, you can't? Uh, uh, Frederick, no. perhaps could you help us? Sure. Can, uh, can you try sharing your screen now? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, can you see it now? No. Oh. Um. Okay. Yeah, now we can we can see your screen. I'm so embarrassed. Okay. So yeah, so basically the um signal ring cells cause a four point um an eight point four percent discrepant rate, whereas um overall frozen sections cause a four point six percent discrepant rate. And then the um, specifically with the esophagastric adenocarcinoma margins, the sensitivity is um, 67%. So you're dealing with a lot of false negatives. I'm sorry you couldn't see my slides. So I was saying that this is a needle in a haystack and we're looking through a lot of tissue and you're looking for really, really small tumor cells in this huge amount of tissue and they look very similar to each other. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> So thank you for this really uh, enlightening uh, uh, comment for us, surgeon, because that's right, we are in the operating room and we are just uh, uh, with uh, uh, waiting and calling every five minutes. So <laughs> did you receive the piece? <laughs> so when are we going to, uh, so I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And for us, it's just uh, plus or, or positive and, and negative and you can uh, help us understand that's not uh, only uh, a button uh, to uh, to click on and to say uh, signature we sell or not <laughs> so Frederic, could you give us uh, the screen I... you should be able to share your screen now. yes Okay, I'm not able to change the slide. Oh, yes, okay. So we decided to perform, as we said before, a total esogastrectomy with right colonoplasty. Unfortunately, we didn't uh, had the, the picture of the specimen, but to have um, an idea of what we do, we, uh, we uh, show you the picture of a specimen for another patient who had um, an esogastrectomy for um, a double localization of uh, esophageal uh, melanoma and, and gastric melanoma. And so uh, we began with a, a thoracic step with a thoracoscopy in left lateral position with four ports, which is uh, usually uh, used for our uh, esophageal resection uh, under any uh, pulmonary uh, ventilation. We like uh, keeping the left uh, lateral um, position instead of a, a ventral position because we think that it's uh, easier in case of, uh, of need of, uh, of open uh, procedure uh, for any uh, problem during the surgery. And uh, then we performed a posterior mediastinectomy, as you can notice here. The second step was the abdominal step through laparotomy. It was a classical gastrectomy with lymph node retrieval and a right colonoplasty. And the last step was a, a cervicotomy to perform a nasal uh, uh, colonic uh, anastomosis. As, as we said before, we don't have the habit to put uh, the uh, anastomosis in the, in the chest, chest for, uh, sorry, for colonoplasty. I don't know uh, your, your feeling about this uh, specific points. Or colonoplasty, do you have the habit to, to put uh, to perform a cervical or a, or a thoracic uh, anastomosis? May I ask a question as a gastroenterologist, please? Yes, sure. Um, 
you have a patient who has ulcerative colitis, yes. does this interfere with your performance of uh, the coloplasty or colonic um, interposition, as we call it here? Right, you're right. Uh, actually, we had uh, skipped this discussion, but uh, uh, we, were, we, were, we were waiting for this kind of question. We gave the, the, this patient that, uh, an history of uh, ulcerative colitis, no treatment, no symptom, and we gave the priority to the treatment of the cancer and not to the, uh, to the colitis, which seemed to be very, very mild. He had a colonoscopy, which uh, was normal. There was, it, it didn't demonstrate any active uh, disease. And we used the colon as a substitute of the other gastric tube. Is there another choice, for example, jejunal interposition under the circumstances, assuming that this patient had relatively active disease? Is that a contraindication? Of course, I think, of course. Uh, an active uh, colitis uh, should uh, be, uh, would be a contraindication for, this, for such an extended resection. And we would have performed uh, total gastrectomy with an intrathoracic oesophageal astomosis with a very high risk of R1 resection. Thank you. It's also positive to do a supercharged jejunal interposition. Complex, complicated, but um, always a possibility. We do that for very proximal esophageal cancers. Who, who is speaking? Uh, Lee Swanstrom from Strasbourg. Yes, yes. Okay, no, no, we, uh, we do not use a supercharger. Uh, as a, in, in, with a small bowel, or even with colon, of course. And we have no experience of this uh, kind of procedure. And you? Obviously, the, the indications are very rare, but uh, we do from time and time with our our um, uh, ENT uh, colleagues, we, we will do the jejunal interpositions for the, that. And this might be a good indication for, for such a thing. But it, for us, for us uh, a history of ulcerative colitis would be a contraindication for a colon interposition, especially in a young patient. Irrespective of the activity, Lee, is that what I understand? Well, correctly? as you know, George, um, <laughs> ulcerative colitis is quite a spectrum of disease. So if there was a significant history of ulcerative colitis, um, active treatment, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, positive confirmation, and not just colitis per se, uh, we wouldn't uh, consider a, a colon interposition. Yeah. Because of the ups and downs of the disease, ulcerative colitis, that is, you don't even know what's going to happen. Of course, I don't know what the prognosis of this is and how long this patient has ahead of him, but I think that would be kind of worrisome to me as a gastroenterologist, at least. And to answer the, the question of uh, um, uh, colic anastomosis in the thorax, we have the experience of two, two cases of uh, adenocarcinoma of the cardia after uh, biotic surgery after sleep gastrectomy. And uh, it was Professor Buitz Gaillet who performed a left uh, thoracotomy with frenotomy and laparotomy. And each time we wanted to use the G genome, but uh, it was too short. And we use a transverse uh, colon with uh, partial um, uh, coloplasty and with anastomosis uh, under the, the arch of the aorta. And uh, for these two patients, um, post-operative was an event uh, uh, was good. Um, I mean, if there is a, a leakage or problem in the, in the thorax, uh, there is in fact a difficulty to, to, for the rescue and we need to do, uh, I mean, a direct uh, procedure. In this case, it's very dangerous to have uh, uh, leakage in the middle of the mediastinum and the thorax. 
I agree with you with that. So, uh, a general comment. In my experience and in the Cologne experience, we have um, uh, coloplasty was very rare because of many things. The function is not good. The anastomosis cervical is a problem. You have to look to the French trial with more than 20%, 30% of anastomotic leakages. The patients are coming to you because of cancer and dysphagia. And after the operation, they have again dysphagia because of the anastomosis cervical. So this is a reason if not absolutely necessary not to do first cervical anastomosis, second coloplasty. And um, uh, I have done in Cologne two cases with, uh, in, in, in Geneva, two cases with coloplasty and with intrathoracic anastomosis. And one of these cases, and it was after a gastrectomy with a, uh, with a leakage, uh, uh, the, the patient was operated outside and there was a leakage on the, uh, uh, on the esophageal ulus to me and there was a stand inside and the stand was impacted and the patient couldn't swallow. And then I have resected it and I have done a coloplasty and an intrathoracic anastomosis. It was a small leakage and with the endosponge, it's healed completely. So I am not so, um, so negative against the intrathoracic anastomosis. But uh, uh, probably we can discuss at the end. Uh, I had done another uh, procedure for this patient, but it's better to discuss it at the end. I have another question as a gastroenterologist. Um, do you feel that uh, an endoscopy is important in the surgical approach? In other words, do you use endoscopy to verify the anastomosis that you're talking about, or that's not particularly useful to you? So, so I think it's uh, absolute for all cancer of the esophageal gastric junction. It's necessary during the operation to, to, right. to, to really to know where is the proximal margin to do endoscopy? This is, uh, in my practice, absolute standard. But I don't look for the anastomosis. Uh, uh, anastomosis with circular stapler and in, 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 in the Cologne technique with oversuching, PDS is very, very safe. And we have a very, very low anastomotic leakage with hybrid esophagectomy, less than 5%. I'll just add in Strasbourg, we always check our anastomosis uh, during the surgery. At the end of it, we'll um, do an endoscopy to check for bleeding, patency, et cetera, an air, air leak test. June 17th, he had an interposition between the esophagus and the duodenum of the right colon segment with a unsued anastomosis. We never use staplers for uh, esogastric or esocolic anastomosis. The postoperative course was an eventful. He resumed oral feeding by the sixth or the seventh day, I don't remind. And he was discharged on the July 4th. And the pathology demonstrated a YPT4 and 3R0 with nine positive nodes among 30. And the response to the treatment was very mild. It was considered a TRG2, it means partial. The question was should we continue the chemotherapy as a perioperative? Uh, treatment. And as we know that the preoperative chemo was not very efficient, and we decided to stop the treatment and to, uh, to go to uh, only the follow-up. The patient was seen uh, by the end of the, the month of August. He lost uh, some kilo. He was uncomfortable for eating. He was seven, 71 kilo. 
back to Tahiti. And we wonder, was it the good option when he left, the, when, when he returned to, to Tahiti? We wondered whether we have a, a good job or not. And we got some news, some last news for this talk uh, this week. We, we, we had a mail, we mailed him uh, last uh, Tuesday. He got the COVID on arrival in Tahiti, he got the COVID. Bad luck. And finally, he, 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 he recovered very easily. Now he gained two kilos. He was he's more comfortable for eating. And he had to be reoperated on an emergency for a small bowel of suction due to adhesions. And the surgeon at the time of surgery could check that the peritoneum was normal and there was no peritoneal carcinomatosis. And the CT scan, the control CT scan, the first follow-up at six months, shows up to now no recurrence. We are happy, but you, we know that this guy has a very bad factors for prognosis, and we fear that he, he will have, he will develop a recurrence uh, in the future. Uh, Denny, I think you have done a very good surgical job. Because of you had no surgical complications and you have resected the tumor as zero. Um, for, the, for the chemotherapy, I agree totally. If chemotherapy is not working in the neoadjuvant arm, in my opinion, it's not a good idea to continue it. It is the protocol of LOT, but uh, something what not works uh, is not good to do after. In the, probably uh, oncologists have another feeling for this, but for a surgeon, it's very clear if it's not work, stop it. Um, the prognosis is very, very bad, I think. Um, the, the, the high risk is the peritoneal carcinomatosis of this N3 situation. N3 is like in the prognosis comparable with distant metastasis. And this is the, this is the big problem I have announced at the beginning of our discussion. Uh, my experience is, in these cases, if it is possible to have a free margin on the stomach, uh, to do uh, uh, Ivar Lewis with a hemigastrectomy, a safe anastomosis, and uh, then it's probably a palliative operation, but the patient can swallow. It's a good result from this side, and uh, this is my uh, experience and my... Uh, uh, idea of the surgery. The question is the question of the post-operative chemotherapy when the preoperative chemo was uh, not efficient with a very with no response the question is always very difficult and when we talk with the oncologist they tend to propose in all the cases uh, uh, post-operative chemo because it is a protocol on the it uh, recalls me this uh, sentence for a man who owns a hammer, everything is like a nail, looks like a nail. And <laughs> when you show a patient with a cancer to, a, to an oncologist, you go to the chemo without, uh, without my name. Yes, but uh, for sick and cellular, uh, it's, uh, it's the exception to, uh, to provide the post operative chemotherapy. So we have discussed this, you know, that uh, Salah Albatron, who has done the, uh, the, 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 floods, uh, uh, the flood trial, is part of the S3 trial, uh, S3 guidelines in Germany. And we have discussed this very, very extensive. And the majority of the old surgeons and the majority of the oncologists said, if there is really no response, uh, then it's, it, it makes not sense to, 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 to continue it. And, uh, you know, 50% of all the patients had not the adjuvant part. And uh, so it's, um, uh, therefore, here in Geneva, uh, Arno Roth, uh, oncologist, is doing six cycles before. And this is, uh, uh, in Munich group is doing this, probably this could be an option to, 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 to because of 50% cannot get the, 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 the adjuvant uh, flood. 
please. May I have something? I'm a medical oncologist. The, the main point is the fact that your patient has lost 25 kilo. When, when you want to move to post-operative chemotherapy, the point is the nutrition point. And the second point is the fact that the FLOT is probably a very aggressive chemotherapy. So if you had a loss of wave and you had an aggressive chemotherapy, you will have a mistake. That's the point. Thank you for this comment. A very clinical uh, comment. Uh, I would like I to add a couple of points uh, on the part of the nutrition. I think that is actually a very significant comment because we as gastroenterologists end up having to manage these patients after surgery. And it's very hard. I presume that this gentleman has significant degree of diarrhea and possible dumping syndrome that uh, compromises his ability for nutrition. Um, and sometimes we use total parenteral nutrition to allow them to gain some weight. And I think that's an important element in the recovery of these patients. Did you have to do that or not really? Yeah, for this uh, specific patient who had a very mild um, uh, loss of weight, we didn't uh, perform a jejunostomy, but that's our uh, very routine uh, uh, management for patients with esophageal uh, cancer. We, uh, oh, for almost all patients, begin with the laparoscopy and uh, put the uh, nonteral uh, jejunostomy uh, at the beginning of the treatment before the first chemotherapy and the patient keep it after the, the, the surgery for the adjuvant chemotherapy. So that's right. The, the question of the nutrition is really a, a, a central question for, for the management of those patients. I think this is a really important point. The units for me, we do it in every case and uh, it's a big advantage. You have it uh, during the chemotherapy or radiochemiotherapy and after the surgery. The second question I have for a group is the second surgery that he had for the adhesiolysis. Do you think that contributes to any possible worsening of the prognosis of this man? In other words, the vascularity that changes during the second operation, does it enhance the risk of expanding any tumor or creating early metastasis, or you don't think that's an issue? We don't think that's an issue. That, that's right that we, we fear of the immunodepression linked with uh, uh, another laparotomy, but um, I don't feel there is no literature or, uh, about this point. I don't know your, your feeling about that, but um, no, I don't think that uh, uh, the path pathology has his uh, own prognosis. And uh, we can't say that because of the new uh, laparotomy, the, the, the patient will have a higher risk of, of peritoneal recurrence. I think that uh, the nature of the, of the tumor is, le is, is linked with a higher risk of, uh, of carcinomatosis. Yeah. Uh Another th theoretical issue is, do we have, from the pathologist standpoint, any evidence of Helicobacter pylori? Uh, typically, these tumors are high up and they're not related to H. pylori, but I don't know about the signet cell carcinoma may be related to H. pylori, and the residence of this patient was Tahiti, which, other than its beauty, has also a lot of H. pylori infection. I think that we have a, a, an expert of Helicobacter pylori in the in the panel. I saw uh, Francis Megro. Perhaps uh, Francis, I don't know if you can hear me. Would like to uh, answer this uh, question? Fr Francis uh, is perhaps not. Uh, here anymore. Yeah, I'm not sure he's connected anymore. Did we find anything on the pathology samples uh, about H. pylori? We know? 
No, on on this for this patient, no, there was it was not related with Helicobacter pylori. We know that often, even for um, gastric adenocarcinoma linked with uh, Helicobacter pylori on the on the on the pieces, uh, the the bacteria has disappeared and 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 it's not uh, on the retrievable. Uh, anymore but for this specific case of signet ring cell cancer it's uh, rarely linked with the uh, helicobacter pylori mm -hmm. thank you i've got one question uh, regarding the final uh, examination it was uh, ypt4e uh, it was uh, where was the invasion it means it was t4 um, peritoneum Peritoneum, yes. And uh, the tumor regression um, grade was two for the uh, tumor or, or for the nodes? It was the same TRG? I see, no, for the tumor, not for the node. I don't, I don't think that the pathologist uh, ev evaluates uh, the regression on the node, but only on the, on the main tumor. We are lucky in Paris because they, they do that. <laughs> And sometimes there is a different response between the tumor and the node. And uh, I mean, in your in your case, uh, it's YPT4, but it's TRG2. And uh, I um, I try to understand what we have what we would have proposed. Uh, there is there is uh, also a small response because it's not TRG5. So uh, maybe we could have. Uh, decided to to propose alternative chemotherapy what people think about that yes we had to we, we had to discuss this we discussed actually this point in our group with the final result of the pathology we finally decided to not continue on chemo first because it was not a standard situation and second for a practical reason because this guy had to go back in Polynesia, to go back at home. And uh, as we can, uh, 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 as far as we know, it was not possible to give him this type of chemo uh, in, yeah. uh, in Papete. I have one question about the lymph node metastasis. Uh, can you say where the lymph node metastasis uh, uh, are located? Sorry, Stefan. Can you do you know where where the lymph node metastases are located? Are they in the thorax? Are they in the in the abdominal? No, I, we do not know. We are, in the beginning. I used to spare the, the nodes and to prepare the specimen and uh, with the proximal and distal node uh, according to the different anatomical groups, but. Uh, it uh, could modify the, the reading of the, the histology and the, because the pathology could not determine if the peripheral margin were free because I had cut in the specimen along the tumor. And for them, it was very, very difficult to, to say whether or not it was a positive margin or not. That's the perfect. And finally, the they asked themselves to not to stop to, sp to prepare the, the specimen and to give them, uh, the, the specimen is, uh, is pinned on, the, on a block, is prepared, but we, we, I do not uh, prepare the, the, the node in the several groups. I would like to, to, to close, to finish this discussion by the problem of colonoplasty. Uh, colonoplasty is a, a classical procedure, uh, which is uh, used from some, some time for salvage, uh, but uh, with a very, uh, very disc, uh, questionable functional results. And I found some studies 
about the quality of life after a colonoplasty. And it was the opportunity to check the early and late results of colonoplasty. And you see that uh, uh, the last study was in the 2019, it was very recent. The early result of colonoplasty show a high postoperative mortality, which is at 5% at 30 days. That, uh, it shows it is a very, very severe, heavy procedure with a very high morbidity and mortality. And the postoperative morbidity is up to 80%, mainly due to leakage and also to pulmonary complications as a, a atherectasia and inf pulmonary infections. Therefore, 40 patients in this large series have to be reoperated during the postoperative course. And this uh, figure should be taken in, ac in, a, in account to take the decision for such a procedure. Regarding the late results, there is a risk of late stenosis, about one third of the patients, reflux, and therefore it is recommended to put a, a Rouen eye loop to the colon and not directly to the duodenum as we have done, but it has the, also some advantages. The problems may be, uh, may be uh, appear uh, late on the post on the in the follow up, and patient have the problem of the redundancy with the dilatation of some segment of the colon, which can be uh, in the cervical, thoracic, or abdominal part of the colonoplasty. And sometimes a reoperation maybe will, should be uh, performed to, uh, to suppress these uh, areas of dilatation. And the quality of life is evaluated from normal to poor. And I think that it is very positive, very enthusiastic to say that the patient has a normal quality of life after a colonoplasty. In my experience, they are always to be still in life with a colonoplasty, but it is very rare to have a normal, uh, a normal comfort for eating and swallowing. And there, are all, there always are some uh, uh, sequela of this, uh, of this procedure. I don't, I, I, and this is, a, it is an important term of the discussion uh, to decide whether or not to perform a, a total uh, oesogastrectomy. And I would like to, to discuss with you about your own experience with colonoplasty and these functional consequences. Uh, Denis, uh, I have to say I rather agree with you, although my my colleague, my young surgeon in, in Portland, Oregon, where I came from before Strasbourg, um, um, Steve Demeester and Tom Demeester published quite a bit on uh, colon interpositions and quality of life and found in fact that the quality of life was fairly good for these patients. So um, my, my personal feeling is that it's not a great quality of life, especially for long term. Uh, as you know, they frequently require revisions after 10, 15 years. And um, uh, so I don't know the answer, but um, uh, there, there certainly is uh, um, other opinions about the quality of life. Uh, well, um, as a gastroenterologist, again, um, I agree with what I heard, but the issue is how much of the life expectancy we have in these patients and to what degree that matters very much. So I don't know. I think comparison to a colonic interposition performed in other patients who have had the need for an extensive esophagectomy would be an interesting perspective. For example, somebody loses their esophagus to caustic injury, as an example, and you need to replace it that we're talking about the next whatever 20, 30 plus years of survival compared to this gentleman who does not have very much, I think, correct me if I'm wrong. So there are different perspectives on this and where you put this colonic interposition. 
I, uh, I think um, the good results published are really only from the group of uh, Demister. And all the other groups, which with not so big experience, but with experience, have, uh, have not so good results at the end. And in my opinion, it is only really only the second choice. If you have no alternative, you have to do it. But with many uh, problems, stenosis, redundancy, and so on. And I would never do it uh, as a first choice. And uh, it's really, if nothing other is possible. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. The Demister papers were mostly about in-stage achalasia, um, yeah. low-grade tumors, et cetera. So you know, that certainly plays a role. And, and in our normal practice, we're very conservative about offering a colon interposition. This was a fantastic presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Denis. You're welcome. And, uh... If there is no question, uh, I think that uh, the, 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 this particular problem of uh, EG junction tumor with uh, signatory cells is uh, very specific. There is no standard, uh, standard treatment which is proposed, routinely proposed. And I think there is a room for a prospective study among the ESO members. I think the ESO is a first place to determine or to, to, to do these kind of studies. And I think I would enjoy to, to participate in the, with, with all the members of the ESO. Thank you. Well, I, as I told you before, the discussion promised to be exciting and it was, and obviously was. I should say the level of the panel, the rigor of the presentations, we learned a lot of things about the new standard for possibly treating the patients with uh, preneoadjuvant chemotherapy or not. The various techniques of surgery were in a beautiful panorama made by Denis and the speaker's contributions were of course to sustain intense interest throughout the session, which I think was really a high level educational exchange of view that will be, that has been recorded by Frederick. And coming back to Denise, to your last slide, uh, your idea seems excellent to me, of course. And Denise and Caroline uh, Grenier are obviously in the best position to take the necessary measures to put this initiative into action. Of course, you could think that I would have this up to you among the 15 pilot centers that you can see on the slide. And I remind you that they are located in the five parts of the world, including Asia, including China, in six centers in China. And I think that this could be a very nice initiative. And uh, they certainly can count on your help. And I'm ready to see with you, Denis, how we can manage this with your initiative and the various pilot centers that can be involved in such a new, a new endeavor. This was my conclusion and thank you in thanking you, Denny, for and Caroline for the beautiful presentation you made with this beautiful slide. And I think that this will be uh, the matter of many visits to our website, I mean the ESO website, and of course the Pilot Center's websites to see exactly the slides, more precisely the slide that you presented and the comments that were given uh, through, the, through the session. And my great best thanks also to Maria Westerhoff, who took a first time with the message from and to Henry Appelman that I asked her to convey to him when they will see each other in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I I'm happy to uh, <laughs> do central review for um, any prospective studies I can offer the pathology review. Well, I think there's an enthusiastic <laughs> agreement for you, Maria. And I can tell you that the next discussion is scheduled for March uh, and more precisely on Friday, March the 19th, 
seven to nine a.m. Pacific time, and it will be held from uh, Stanford, from Palo Alto, with uh, the team of uh, George Triadafilopoulos and John Clark and Dan Azaguri that will be there to present a, a case. And uh, after that, I think uh, that we can already announce that on April the 15th, in April, uh, Stéphane Bonnet and uh, Brice Gaillet will see uh, the, how to best organize a discussion of very interesting case. If I remember well, they were planning to show uh, records uh, after surgery for achalasia. And I think that it will be a very interesting discussion that we may plan for in April the 15th. Is Stefan, are you here? Yeah. Do you agree for the date that you proposed the date is, this uh, time? Perfect. We're yes. waiting for you. Perfect. And we are also uh, waiting to welcoming you for the one of the very next uh, discussion, clinical case discussion. And thank you again for your contribution and participation to this beautiful discussion. Thank you.